without any further ado, I want to introduce to some and present to others the great man of God that is going to bring us the word this morning, Pastor Larry Omonaye. Thank you. So, I'll just, you know, uh, take a leave from where I started last week and in order to This is the prince, and it helps us as we try to do other things. But again, we came to the conclusion that uh, this alone is not just enough, and that we have to add to it. This is like the quarterback, and then also you have the running back, you have the tight end, and all, and we have all that stuff there going, um, going on in there. So. Uh, but one thing I really want to emphasize, one thing I want to bring back for us to emphasize is that as we're rounding up, we're rounded up with the fact that all that Paul was telling us about through Timothy, through his letter to Timothy, was that we have to take control or have control over our funds, our money, and all of that, right? And... We said the only way that he has shown us, what he has shown us, what he has told us about that is self-control. And um, I want you to understand that self-control is not anything external from you, okay? You have self-control already. It is the fruit of the Spirit. As long as you have the Holy Spirit, there is that presence of the fruit of self-control on your inside. The only thing is, have you been able to harness it? Have we been able to connect with it? If you connect with it, God will be able to help you to make sure that you have control over your funds. All right, let's go on from where uh, uh, we were to, uh, from last week. Let's jump into what we have today. And the primary thing I want to be talking about is savings. All right, but I'll take it from a very different angle. And I hope that at the end of the day, you will be able to get something. All right. Can you open with me to 2 Corinthians 10? Sorry, 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9 from verse 6. I'll start from verse, verse 6 to 10. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 10. Are we there? Okay. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. All right? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Eight. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, and at all times may abound unto every good work. I want to quickly make an emphasis on eight before I, before I jump. And I want to tell you that this is where God wants us as believers to be. He wants us to be here where we have, he's, he's making all grace abound towards us. That we have in all sufficiency, in all things, at all times, and we are able to abound to every good work. Unfortunately, sometimes we have taken scriptures in, 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 uh, in, out of context, so, so to say. All right? And then we have run with some things, and that has become an impediment to us. Say, for instance... A lot of places where we have camped as Christians is that my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God wants to do more than supply your needs. He wants to bring you to a place where you can have all your needs met and have enough to commit to every good work. And it was, it's because of this mentality that my God will supply all of my needs that we have become, as Christians sometimes, very consumption conscious, uh, conscious. So we think that everything that God brings our way or our path is for our needs. Because we have come there. And I call that, you know what I call that? I call that the manna mentality. You have that manna mentality, you have a need, God supplies it, and God supplies it, and God supplies it, and all of that, and we keep living that way. Not knowing that God wants to take us from the, temp, uh, from the wilderness into the promised land. And in the promised land, guess what's going to happen? God wants to join you, wants you to join him in the creation of wealth. Because in the wilderness, I mean, in the, in, the, in the promised land, guess what is there? Milk and honey. 
But because we have this mentality, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, guess what? We have camped in that place where our mentality just remains in God just meeting every of our needs. But how does God do this? The Bible says he has made all grace abound towards us. In other words, there's grace for you if you are going to flow in the abundance of God. Grace is made available. It's already there. You already have it and we'll see it in scriptures. All right? Verse 9. Let's go to verse 9. And as it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. All right? Now, may he who supplies seed to the soul. Now, can you give me this 10 in uh, NLT? NLT, I want the NLT version. Okay. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread for the eater. Do you see that? He gives you both seed and bread. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. What does this scripture mean? But before then, I want you to understand. I just want you to understand what is leading to this by just giving you a brief synopsis of what uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is all about, right? Paul was taking an offering for the church at Jerusalem. And he had to uh, encourage people, the people who are, you know, a part of the church that he has influenced. He has to encourage them to be a part of this generosity to the church at Jerusalem. Now, the people Paul was talking to actually have their own problems. They have financial problems. They have all kinds of issues. But Paul was still admonishing them that they need to give. All right? And the people of Corinth also felt they had needs. And Paul, if you read his readings, if you read his writings from chapter 8 to verse 9, uh, chapter 9 together, you know what he was saying? He was saying, you think you have needs? You think you have needs? You don't have needs as much as these guys in Jerusalem. You know why? Because at that time, we were told that those guys in Jerusalem, there was famine in Jerusalem. So the church had a natural problem that they could not go to farm. They could not, and and if, you, if you couldn't farm in those days or you have your cattle, you're almost done. Now, on top of that, the church in Jerusalem was facing persecution. And the persecution was so high because the, the way things were in those days, if you declare that you're a Christian, guess what? You're ostracized from society. And that's why even if you look from Acts chapter 5, you will see that the church was taking care of people. There were some people who could not, you know, meet the needs. And the Bible says they all came together. Remember, our, our, uh, you know, our, uh, our grace groups, those are part of the things I want to do. They all came together and they prevented what they have. They brought it to the apostles' feet. And the apostles ministered to people as there was need. What I'm telling you is that Paul was not encouraging them, telling them that the church at Macedonia, in fact, when they started, the church at Corinth was the most generous church of all. And Paul used them as an example to the Macedonian church. And the Macedonian churches comprised of, you know, uh, the, the church of the uh, Philippians, that's Philipp Philippians, uh, and the Thessalonians, and the uh, Berean church. They were the church at the Macedonian place, right, in the Macedonian region. And Paul is now telling them that these guys have even become more generous than you. You set the example, but they are now more generous than you. He was trying to challenge them. Talk about the student becoming the teacher of the teacher. But having gotten that background, I just want you to see this particular one. Verse 10. He said, for God. No, give me, give me. Uh, okay, there, leave, leave it. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. And bread to the eater. One of the reasons why I like the writings of Paul is that he used imageries, he used illustrations, he uses allegories to explain his points. He gives us a point of reference. And it's not only limited to Paul. It, Paul took an example where he lived from Jesus Christ, right? Jesus told parables. Jesus told stories. He used allegories to express spiritual truths. In other words, he used natural truths to express spiritual truths. And that's what Paul was doing here. And what I want you to know from verse 10 is that for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to the eater. In other words, every blessing that God provides for you, every gift, every blessing that God gives you, every blessing, every, especially in the area of finances, comprises of both a seed and bread. 
The problem with us is that we have not been able to distinguish or recognize the fact that for when God blesses you, he blesses you with both seed and bread. So what, we, what do we do? The tendency is that when God blesses us with seed and bread, we consume our seed and consume our bread together. And it becomes a problem. For the seed, two things and bread. Now, we know that bread is for you to eat. Bread satisfies. Bread nourishes. All right? Bread strengthens. So God wants to take care of you in that area. But at the same time, God wants you to also know that there is seed to be had. There is seed to be used in, in, as part of the blessings that he has given you. So your bread will always go here. Right? So you spend it to satisfy you and everything you, know, you need to do. You meet your needs. You meet all of that and bread. But for the seed, it comes to this bucket and this bucket contains your seed. Apart from bread satisfying you, what other things are, uh, what, does, what other things does the seed do? The seed does not satisfy. The seed produces fruit. All right? So part of your seed goes to this bucket, your giving bucket, and the other part goes to your savings bucket. And if we don't understand this, we shorten ourselves, we shortchange ourselves because everything we do goes here. And the seed that's supposed to produce a harvest for us ends up not bringing about the harvest. But let me quickly say something about saving. When I say savings, it's an all-encompassing word, not just for you to just keep your money, but for you to use your money in such a way that it will be able to provide seed. I mean, it will be able to provide fruit. It will, it will provide fruit. In other words, investment is part of savings. So I just shortened all of it together, using your money well, all right? So because we have not recognized that everything that God gives us, there's an element of the seed there and there's an element of the bread there, we go there and guess what happens to us? We begin to exhibit our, you know, prodigal tendencies because we all have prodigal tendencies sometimes if we don't control it. All right? The story of the prodigal son, the biggest problem the guy had was not that uh, he was, uh, one of the biggest problems he had, you know, apart from the fact that he was just a, you know, he was just um, not a very good guy, was that he also had a problem of profligacy, just spending money and not knowing how to keep the money. The Bible says he went to uh, wherever he went to and he wasted his funds. He wasted his money on uh, the far country where he went to, all right? So now, having known that, having seen this, I now want to, you know, focus on this. Because sometimes when we talk about savings, guess what people think? A lot of times people think it is counterproductive. What are you talking about? You know, why are you talking about uh, 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 savings? Why are you, uh, why, 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 why do you think uh, savings is good when God can meet all of my needs? When God is supposed to spend all of my, when God is supposed to make all of my, if you look at God, the way God does his things, right? Like I told you, when they left the wilderness, God moved them into the promised land. And when he moved them into the promised land, they had to start figuring out things just like God, just like, uh, just like God has ordained it, all right? Now, let us read some scriptures that I want you to see concerning savings. Because sometimes I've heard somebody actually did tell me some, some, something. He said that savings is ungodly. Yeah, he told me. He said savings is ungodly. He says it's a sign of a lack of faith. That's exactly what he told me. That if you do that, it's a lack of, you know, it's a lack of faith. You're not depending on God. You're not, uh, uh, you, don't, you don't believe God can meet all of your needs. And I was telling him that God is not in the business of just meeting your needs. God is in the business of wanting you to get into a, a land of abundance, all right? And some of these things are the reasons why we're not doing uh, uh, very well financially. We're under pressure a lot of times. Okay, so let's look at uh, Proverbs 21, 20. Proverbs 21, 20. Look at what it say. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. Do you see that? But a foolish man spends it all. If you read Proverbs 13, 
verse 23. It talks about there's much food in the tillage or in the fallow ground, in the all uncultivated land of the poor. And chapter 12, verse 11 tells us that the way to make this happen is to cultivate your land. And one of the ways that we can cultivate this land is what I'm trying to show you this, this, uh, this morning, actually when it comes to our seed, all right? So there's much, what does it say? It said there's much oil, there's much treasure in the house of the wise man. Talking about grace, that God has made all grace abound towards us. But what are we doing with his grace? Because sometimes in the area of our finances, we tend to frustrate the grace of God. But God has made his grace available for us. We saw it here in, first, in 2 Corinthians 9 when Paul was saying, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. There's all grace that's already abounding towards you. But what are you doing to the grace that God has given to you? Unfortunately, many times we don't do uh, 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 much with it, right? Okay, another one that, uh, that helps us to be able to understand saving. Open to Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Which give no guide, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provides her meat in summer and gather her food in the harvest. I want to tell you that for us to be able to improve and increase and get over this financial pressure and enter into that land of financial freedom, we need to be able to understand the role that savings plays. If you are not putting something aside and you are not investing part of what you put aside, you are going to run in trouble very soon. The Bible says, walk while it is yet day, for the night comes when no one can walk. I know, I know, I know some of you are very, very, you know, Bible scholarly. You tell me that Jesus Christ was talking about the works of ministry. Yes, absolutely, he was talking about the work of ministry, but he was using a natural phenomenon to explain the spiritual truth. So it still does not negate the fact that a time is coming. Because I know people who will tell me, oh, you know, my God has ordained me. God has called me. I am like Moses. Uh, my natural force is not abated. My eye is not distant. But I want to tell you that Paul told us that at some point, though our natural man decays, a time is coming when you are supposed to walk and there's a time when you're supposed to rest. And it is what you do in your time of abundance. You remember the story in, in, in Genesis 41 when uh, 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 Pharaoh had a dream. He was, he was on the Nile or around the Nile and said he saw seven fat cows came out of that, you know, uh, of that river and all of that, river Nile and all of that. And then he saw another seven lean ones and they came out and they didn't understand what was going on. And they ended up having Joseph coming to interpret the dreams for them. And Dr Joseph told them, he said, look, he said there's seven years of abundance that's going to come out and that is represented by the seven fatted cows. And then there are seven lean cows that are going to come. I mean, there is a lean time. There's a time of harvest and famine. I mean, there's a time of famine and scarcity that's going to hit the world that is represented by the lean cow or cow. And what you need to do in the time of your abundance, you need to set some things apart so that at the time when that, when that a famine and whatever it is hits you, you have something left to be able to do. I want to put it to you this morning that a lot of times our needs, it's not because God has not supplied. God has already supplied everything that we need. The only thing is that we did not plan well with what God has given us. Because like I told you, there's bread, and there is seed. And it's only your seed that can yield fruit or a harvest. Your bread strengthens you, allows you to go around, do whatever you need to do. And whatever is left goes to waste. Bread does not have the capacity to reproduce itself. It's only your seed 
that has an inbuilt capacity to be able to reproduce itself. And we have to understand it. We have to come to that point where we understand that, that as Christians, God has given us the ability. He has given us all things. He has made all grace to abound towards us. And we need to make that grace count in our lives. Savings means spending below your earnings, right? But we always have an excuse. It is always not enough. How can I save what is not enough? How can I take aside what is not enough? I don't have enough, and you say I should save. But if you don't begin, if you don't start to do that, to figure out that that's in every seed that God has given you, there is a potential seed and a potential breath there. You are going to continue in that track of consumerism. And before you know it, you are going to keep living in that alley of need. Because embedded in every seed is the future of that seed. Every seed has a future. Bread has no future. Right? No bread has future. You just take it, you eat it, you consume it, it's done, it's going to the bathroom. <laughs> but only a seed has in itself the power to regenerate itself, to recreate itself. And if you don't engage the power of the seed, guess what? You are going to eat your seed, it's not going to produce fruit for you and it's not going to satisfy you because seed is not meant or created to satisfy. It is created, it is meant to reproduce. And only in this place can it, in, in, if you look at uh, uh, that verse 10, he said, God will give you, he gives bread, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater and guess what he does? You know, uh, and guess what he does? He said he will multiply the fruit of your harvest and increase your righteousness. One of the, you know, that's why last week I was telling you that when you give, you sow your seed, it has spiritual implications. Am I correct? And Paul is now saying that giving, when we follow it, when we do it the way we should do it, it increases the fruits of our righteousness. When you give, that is one product that seed produces in you. First and foremost, it improves, it increases the fruits of your righteousness. Although sometimes we are always in that, you know, God give me, God, uh, God give me more, God bless me, God this. Yes, God has already blessed you. All he wants you to do is do what you need to do. Now, so when you do this, there's a blessing. And when you do this, it provides for you. It provides for you. It provides for your future. So never enough is not a reason why you should not save. In fact, it is a reason why you should start it. If you look close enough, the, uh, the widow of Zarephath, she thought she had nothing. Elijah told her, she said, what do you have in your house? She said, nothing. But you and I know that she has much more that was able to bail her out. First, he bailed Elijah out. He bailed her out, bailed her son out, bailed her for generations to come just because of what she had. I want us to take our mentality, our minds out of it is barely enough. It is not enough. If you do that, you will never be able to use your seed. You will never be able to engage the power of the seed. Get your mind off that and begin to do it. Find ways to do it. Small personal story here. I remember when, you know, some time ago, we, 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 had, we, had, we had two kids at that time and you know, uh, my wife and I had two kids at that time. We, I'm confused. Okay, oh, okay, 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 okay. I get it now. I get, I get it now. I get it now. I get it. Now. I get it. But hey, excuse me. But you guys don't know if I've adopted a kid, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now we had. We had I wanted to say at the time. We, you know, we, we had our two kids at the time. We have only two kids, and, you know, at the time, we just had them, all right? And we had them at the time, all right? 
And what happened is that we were so tight financially. Things were so tight. I mean, if you look at it from the natural, it was so tight. It was very, very tight. But we had to make, we had to make adjustments to certain things. Number one, we knew we could not go on vacation. Because when we look at where to cut, it was not right for us to cut here because we are going to disengage the power of the seed. Here, we could not cut here because we are going to disengage the power of the seed, the one that, re that returns to us. So the only option that we had was here. This was the only place. And one of the big cuts that we made was that we decided we were not going to go to um, uh, the, the babysitter. We are going to do it between ourselves. So I got a night job at the factory. My wife got a, mo a morning job. And how were we doing? You remember what I'm saying? How were we doing it? She, because I closed at 7 at the time. And my wife starts work at 7.30 or 8.30 or something. I, I, you know, I can't remember when. But guess what? She will stay with the children overnight. She will bring them to my place. Because if I go home, I will not. Because the place I work was very far. I was working at Fulton Industrial at that time. And Fulton Industrial to where I was in Mirata was really a distance. All right? So she will, she will wake up early, take care of the children, bring them to Fulton Industrial. And then I'll pick them in the car, go back home to go and figure out how I was going to take care of them because we could not afford daycare. At the same time, we could not afford not to do this and this. And that was the major place where we could cut. What I'm trying to tell you is that there are things that you can do. Sacrifice to prepare for the future. You cannot give an excuse that it is not enough. Whatever God has given you is enough. You need to find something somewhere. The seed is resting somewhere. Now, you know, I'm not discounting the fact that, you know, there's some extraordinary situation where it is really not enough. I'm not discounting that. But I'm just talking that on a general basis, on a regular basis, you have to find the, the seed there. If you don't find the seed there, you will, I have seen people who are, uh, uh, you know, I, I've seen people who are, true story, I've seen somebody who was a managing director, CEO of a place. By the time he retired, he did not have anything left. Could not take care of himself. Because he did not engage the power of the seed. In a time of abundance. So quickly, what are we saying? What does savings do for you? Savings helps you to lay treasure. You look at uh, Luke 12, 21. It helps you. That's the place. You know the story of, a, uh, of the farmer who had, you know, who, who came to abundance? The problem was not that the guy kept some things. The problem was that he depended on the thing. And that's why I started from, you know, depending on riches last week. The problem was not the guy, that the guy broke down his bands and wanted to expand. That's not the problem. The issue was that that was his life. So savings, number one, helps you to lay up treasure. You lay up treasure. You know, uh, one of my very good friends is my next door neighbor. He's, um, 80, he's 84 now. He's going to turn 85 in March. But we're very good, very good friends. And uh, he came to me Monday or something. We were just talking on Monday. And he said, look, man, he said, I'm so, you know, I'm so, uh, I'm so, I'm so happy with, you know, my, my grandson. I'm so happy at what he has, what he has achieved and all of that, and, um, you know, he gradu I mean, he's graduating this year, he's already gotten into college, and he's gotten some money and all of that, and so what I'm planning to do is I'm going to buy him his first car. That's the grandfather. What happened? He had laid up treasure, and this guy taught me a lot of things. The guy never worked any big job. He said he worked blue-collar job all his life. Worked blue-collar jobs. At first, he worked in a store, in a clothing store, where he was selling, um, he was selling clothes, all right? And when that job ended, because it was a family business, and when they decided to close the business, he went and worked at a racetrack, cleaning horses and all of that. But he said he heard that he needed to keep his pennies. He needed to keep his pennies. The man is living large. You know why? Because over a period of time, he has kept some things aside, and the best friend of your money is time. And as time begins to brood over your resources, guess what? It begins to produce if you allow time to brood over it. 
And that's how he, you know, he, I mean, he told me, he told me that he has saved so much for his grandkids that by the time, you know, by the time he's gone, they have something very substantial that they're going to get. He told me how, you know, every time a new grandkid come, they, they will go there with the son and they will re, rearrange what everybody will get. But everybody's going to get something. You know why? He's laying up treasure. If he blew everything that he had at the time that he had them, guess what? He will not be able to do what he's doing. Savings provides for the future now. It helps you to provide for the future now. In other words, whatever you keep now is going to be a seed that's going to be reflected in the future. So that when that time comes, when you cannot work anymore, you still have an abundance of your money that has been kept, that has been reserved, that is working for you. In other words, you will tell, you know, so the, the, the problem with us sometimes is that we have eaten our future in the past. And so you find somebody who is 70 years old and all of that, and, you know, they're just suffering because they did not recognize their future. Number three. You are able to build an inheritance and influence the future. I've told you about my friend. I have another story. I'm just going to I'll tell you another story. Um, a few years back, I went to, uh, I, my friend wanted his children to come and school here. They're, you know, foreign students and all that. But he wanted them to come to boarding school and high school here. So I took them to one school. Not Georgia. I don't want to call the name. I don't want to give them free commercials. Free and that. So I took them to North Georgia. And when I took them to North Georgia, beautiful school. I've never seen how, I've never seen a school that is that beautiful. Beautiful school on the mountains. High class resources. And when we asked for the price, they were calling some kind of, you know, ridiculous price. And I'm like, no, 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 no. If you are going to go to a boarding house in the U.S. and you are paying this amount, I've forgotten that amount, but it's ridiculously low. I said, no, it's, it's definitely not a good school. And the admission guy just laughed and told me, he said, no, he said, he said, look, we don't depend on school fees here. We don't depend on school fees. He said, because the woman that gave us the land that we are building on and that we have our campus on now bought some shares of Coca-Cola many years ago. She kept them, she preserved them, and when she was dying, she bequeathed them to us. And as she bequeathed them to us, we are making a good money to be able to run the school, pay the staff, do everything and all of that, and then help our children and families and parents to be able to pay less. Because the woman said she wants to keep influencing the future generation. And even though she's dead, yet she speaks. Because she has prepared for the future. And she is blessing the people, generations of children that she did not, she does not even know. She never came across. They never knew her. The only thing they know about her is the little cottage that she has in that campus. And then her picture that is there. Because she has become their benefactor based on what she did. Finally, it sets the foundation for a more generous life. When you save, when you keep, it sets the foundation for a more generous life. You see, if all that you can give is, some people still depend on 10% and all of that. That's all you are doing. You just give your 10% and all of that, and that is that, right? You give your 10%. But when you have something, and that thing is generating funds for you, you have your 10% to give, and then you still have the extra, because you are now having extra that is being produced for you. So you have the foundation. You are building a strong foundation. That's what that woman did. She built a strong foundation that has made her to be much more generous than she could ever be if she was alive. So what am I saying? I'm saying that we have to recognize the power of the seed. And it's our savings that helps us to be fruitful. When it comes to financial fruitfulness, it's the savings, not the spending. And that's why we have to be much more committed to this area, to making all these things happen, so that at the end of the day, we can live well and beautifully. I'll just tell a story now, but I'll, I'll cover this. I know my wife does not want me to say it, but I'll say it anyway, all right? 
<laughs> but I'll, I'll do it in disguise. I'll do it in disguise. Now, my wife has a very good friend. I don't know what's between my wife and, you know, she likes old people and I like old people too, all right? So she has this woman who is her friend, 88 years old woman. And on her 88th birthday, I guess, she invited us for lunch. And that the place she took us to was a very, very expensive place in, you know, in Bucket. So, for those of you who live outside Atlanta, Buckhead is, you know, a neighborhood in, you know, within Atlanta, the city of Atlanta, all right? And we went there with this 88-year-old woman, and as we were talking, I mean, she looked strong, she looked nice, she looked well-dressed, and as we were talking and talking, and I was talking to her, and she told me something. She said, I want to keep this going for as long as I can. What does that mean? She wants to keep her life going for as long as she can. She wants to live for as long as she can. She's already 88. And she still, have hope, she still has hope of living, uh, of, of, of living much longer. And I said, so what would be the th reason why, this will not, why you will not want to live anymore? And she said, number one, if I cannot take care of myself, if I don't have strength enough to take care of myself, and two, if I'm under financial pressure. And right now, I'm not under any of both. 88-year-old woman, very strong. She lives in a very expensive, you know, thing. And when I asked her, what, what did you do? She said, well, by the grace of God, God has been able to help us to put something aside. And now, you know, she's still, she's still very strong. She still walks, but she walks as a volunteer. And they love her that they don't want her to leave because she's still strong, she's still agile. Why? There's something about the anointing that keeps you. There's also something about financial peace that helps you to remain strong. You cannot, you know, the Bible says money answers all things. Anointing answers a lot of things too, but money also answers a lot of things. And if we are not ready for the future, we are going to be overtaken by the circumstances of the present. And that is going to render us, you know, limited. It's going to render us sometimes hopeless for the future. And that's not where God wants us to be. God wants us to move out from the land of barely abundant, of barely enough, to the alley of abundance. God bless you.